All right, everybody, let's go and get started. Okay, so I'll get the sign-in sheet passed around. All right. So a couple of things. Um, let me go ahead and pass these lecture notes out. We kind of talked about them last time, but um, oh goodness, uh, I will uh, talk about them in a little more detail uh, this time since you all have the handout. Um, one of the things that's worth pointing, one of the things that's worth pointing out is um, let me go ahead and pass these out. We did two different types of singly reinforced beam design, one where we did not have a clue what the cross section looks like, and one where we knew exactly what it looks like. Does everybody have a one-way slab design handout? Okay. The reason why that was important to do first is because slab design is actually fairly straightforward because of its inherent nature and, and our uh, process for design. Now I'm just going to real quick go through, go through some of this. So, we talked about last time how, you know, floor systems are not just beams. There's actually slabs and whatnot that we stand on as well. Um, later on, what we'll do is we'll ask ourselves, well, what if the uh, beams and the slabs are cast together? And that'll lead into our discussion of flanged sections, i.e. T-beams and L-beams. <coughs> um, we also mentioned the difference between a one-way slab and a two-way slab. And it's very basic. One-way slabs we assume to bend in one direction. Two-way slabs we assume to bend in two directions. Um, two-way slabs tend to be more economical, but they're way uh, a little bit tougher to analyze, I guess I should say. So um, for now, we'll do one-way slab. Maybe near the end, if we got a little bit of time, we'll go back and say, well, how do you do a two-way slab? Um, you, again, two-way slabs tend to be a little thinner, and the reinforcement patterns can be a little more regular, so that's kind of nice. Now, from a design standpoint, uh, we know what the cross-section looks like when it comes to slabs because we typically assume uh, just a 12-inch width and then we design the required reinforcement for that 12 inches and then just repeat it across the board. So um, uh, if you ever hear this called the, the strip method, this, this tends to be what we use. Uh, they still do this actually also for bridge design, especially if you're looking at things like the overhang. Um, the part from the exterior girder over to where the barrier is, we, t we still use uh, traditional strip methodology to design that reinforcement, and it's really not that much different than, than what I'm doing here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one thing that I should point out is that unlike beams, we're going to have to provide an additional layer of steel for slabs uh, called temperature steel. Um, it, it's placed in the opposite direction, and it's meant to uh, withstand uh, temperature effects, creep, shrinkage, all, all the little cracking that you can get in slabs because slabs by their very nature are inherently thin. So we have to try and prevent that. Um, <laughs> one point I'll mention, cover for slabs is going to be three quarters of an inch. That's what we're going to use for, for our cover requirements. All right, so the width of the slab is known. The height of the slab is also known because we tend to use just the minimum height uh, based off of the deflection considerations that we used before for beam estimation. We tend to just use that height directly for slab design. So if you know the base of the, you know the, the width of the beam, you know the height of the, uh, the beam, and then you know the effect of depth as being the height minus this three quarters of an inch, then it's funny how you know the cross section. And then if you know the cross section, all you have to do is just use this approach for the purposes of selecting your reinforcement. So it's pretty straightforward from a uh, point of view of design. We compute the factored moments on the beam, which we know because we know what the uh, self weight of the slab looks like. So we assume, so we still have to assume a fee value of 0.9. We calculate a row for design purposes. Again, we're not using that 0.18 FC prime over FY because we now have a good idea of what the beam looks like. So if we know what the beam looks like, we don't need to assume some blanket row value for the purposes of design. We calculate. We calculate our required steel, rho BD, and then choose a pattern. Um, a couple things to point out. We have to choose uh, a main steel pattern and a temperature steel pattern. We'll talk about that here in a second, but before I do, I have sort of a, a little handy dandy tool I need to give you all. So this is similar to the one that you all uh, saw before, only it, it's a little different because this beam chart is, is meant purpose or uh, specifically 
four slabs. Okay, so I'm gonna pass this out. Do you have one? Do you have one? Oh, Mr. Yukonich, you did make class interesting. I have an iron will, sir. <laughs> um, so what you're looking at here is essentially a, a, a beam to, or a, 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 a spacing chart like what we did before, only instead it's looking at uh, uh, bars spaced evenly. And basically what it's saying is this is the area of steel you can count on per foot if you have an even increment. So to give you kind of an idea of how this table is computed, if you look at the very bottom, like if you have number three bars spaced at 12 inches, how many of them do you have per foot? Look at this bottom row. That's just the area of each of the bars. So if this, this would be what you would get. Now let's say, let's look at the row where it says the spacing is six inches. If the area of a number three bar, let's say, is 0.11, and you space them every six inches, how, many, how much area do you have per foot? You have double. You have 0.22. So do you all see where this is coming from? And this is just based on a bar spacing, what is your area of steel per foot? And we're going to use that to select a reinforcement pattern for slabs. Because slabs, by their very nature, the reinforcement is very repetitive. You're going to see the same pattern from beginning to end. Center to center. Center to center. That's a good question. All right. Everybody good? OK. Let's, uh, there's a couple other things I need to mention, and then we'll get into an example. So a couple things. Um, when it comes to our main reinforcement, um, we have to, uh, we, we, we select it based on our required reinforcement ratio and a pattern that makes sense out of that table. That being said, we have to make sure that whatever bar spacing that we pick it has to be the lesser of 3H and 18 inches. So it's one of those things where um, uh, just because you select a, an economical reinforcement pattern, it doesn't mean it meets spacing requirements. For beams, what we were worried about was too many bars lumped too closely together so that we couldn't even fit them inside the beam. For slabs, we're actually worried more about bars being spaced too far apart because we don't want some space in the slab where there's virtually no reinforcement and we're putting load on it, that would be bad. So we have to have at least some uh, relatively uh, even uh, spacing, but at the same time we want that reinforcement to fill in some of those weak spots in the slab. Now, main reinforcement goes along the longitudinal direction of the slab. We also have to provide tension or a temperature reinforcement along the perpendicular direction, and instead of actually like, like going and calculating some required reinforcement ratio and what have you. The spec says we just have to provide 0 .0018 times B times H. We calculate that and that's the amount of steel we have to provide for temperature reinforcement. So it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's not a very complex calc. It's just some additional layer we have to provide on the bottom. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to design a one-way slab the span length of that slab is going to be 10 foot long. We're going to use normal weight concrete with a, unit, or a compressive strength of 4,000 PSI, um, grade 60 reinforcement. This slab, however, we're not going to subject it to any significant dead load. It's just going to be subjected to a live load of 200 pounds per square foot on the top. That doesn't mean it's not subjected to dead load because every beam is subjected to some modicum of dead load by way of its what? Its self weight. All right. So there we go. Everybody all right with that? OK. All right. Now before we um, get into this problem, I want to actually just make sure everybody is clear with what it is that we're designing. I want you to have that mental picture in your head. OK. I'm going to use my 3D art skills, so bear with me. So let me see how good I am at this.
Okay, so we have these two beams, and what I'm saying is that on top of these beams, we have a slab. And that slab exists, you know, three-dimensionally. Okay, so when I say span length, we're looking at the slab. And basically, another way of looking at the span length on a slab for something like this is basically saying that these beams are spaced 10 feet apart. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what we do for the purposes of design is that we isolate a small segment of that slab and design it as if it was a typical beam. So what I'm doing is I'm basically saying we're going to design this small strip of the beam right here. that that's the strip of the beam I'm going to design. Now, help me out. How wide is that strip going to be? 12 inches. And how tall is it going to be? Well, we need to determine that. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So, let me do something real quick just so that we're clear on what we're doing. I'm going to erase this shading right here. I like using different colors to sort of express what I'm talking about. All right. So if I take a look at this green shaded region right here, okay, that is the cross section of the beam, right? Remember, secret weapon of structural engineering is either a, a samurai sword or a lightsaber, depending on whether or not you are a sci-fi fan. Okay? So if I take this, this segment and I cut through it with a section, I'm looking at a beam cross-section that looks something about like this. Okay? So, and I'm going to 3D this one as well. And there's a reason why. Okay, so this dimension is, again, 12 inches. Okay, now, watch what we're going to do. Like I said before, we are going to place two different types of rebar into this system. Okay, we're going to place some amount of main steel, and I'm not saying it's three bars. I'm just saying we're going to place some main steel in this. And it's going to go like this, right? So we'll say the red right here, that's the main steel. Okay? Now, we've got a couple dimensions here. The total height of the beam is... is H, right? But... From here, this is D, right? And how are we going to calculate D? We take H and we subtract. What's our cover? Three quarters of an inch. So we'll just keep it simple and assume three quarters of an inch for the purposes of what we're doing. All right? Oh, actually, no, 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 no. Let me, let me take that back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We're going to say, uh, we're gonna say uh, H minus 1 inch, and let me explain why. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll explain that here in a second. So let me sort of give me room to write. We'll say H minus 1 inch, and let me explain why. Sorry about that. Okay, now, in addition to main steel going along the span, we're going to also have a certain amount of steel going like this. This is our temperature steel. 
right? So if I look at this beam up top, I'm going to have like a rectangular grid. I'm going to have main steel going like this and temperature steel going like that. Does that make sense? I just want you all to understand the directions and where this stuff is coming from. Am I good? Okay. Now let me clear up this cover thing real quick. So I'll, I'll even put this off to the side. Cover. I'm going to say we're going to assume D is H minus 1 inch. Because if I look at the bottom of that slab and I have some piece of rebar, I need this dimension to be 3 quarters of an inch. But D is measured from the center up, right? So there's gonna, it's going to be a little more than 3 quarters of an inch, so 1 inch is probably a good guess for right now. Is that a fair statement? Okay. All right. Sorry about that confusion. All right. Does everybody understand what we're doing and why we're doing it? That, that, that's one thing I really want you to understand is the dimensions, where I'm getting my values, where everything's coming from, uh, and what have you. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So you all have the slide packet and you have a very nice step-by-step -step expression, you know, what have you. What's step one? Factored moments. So there's two things that are going to contribute moments, right? The self-weight of the slab and the live load. Okay? So let's start off with the self-weight of the slab. How wide is the slab? Well, how wide is our width? 12 inches. How tall is it? We're going to use H equals H minimum. What is the minimum height of a slab? Depends on that table, right? Okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to actually here I'll, I've got extras over here. Instead of pulling it up, you all have it in front of you. Those of you watching the video can rewind a little bit. That's no big deal. So, I'm looking at solid one-way slabs. Um, what do we have? Do we have a simply supported slab? Do we have a continuous slab? Both ends continuous, a cantilever slab. What do we have? Simply supported. So, if we have a simply supported slab, how do we calculate the minimum height? We take the length and divide it by, what is the length? 10 feet. Maybe for the purposes of simplifying this, all right, so 10 times 12 divided by 20, that is 6 inches. Is everybody all right with that? So we've got... B is 12 inches, we've got H is 6 inches, and we've got that D is what? 5 inches. So there's our slab dimensions right off the bat. We're going to have a 6 inch thick slab. Everybody good? Okay, now, therefore, how do we calculate the self-weight? How have we been doing that before? We take the unit weight of concrete and we multiply it by what? There we go, times B times H. So in order to keep this simple, I'm going to say 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot. I'm going to say 12 inches. I'm going to say 6 inches. I'm going to say, actually I'll do that in a different color so that I'm being consistent. I'm going to say that one square foot is 144 square inches, right? All right. Plug and chug, and that's going to give you 0 0.075 kips per foot.
How are we feeling? So far so good? Now, how do you think we're going to do the live load? I'm going to ask you this. You tell me what you think. We have 200 pounds per square foot. We can't just use that directly because we need a uniformly distributed load. So what do I do with that 200 pounds per square foot? Multiply it by what? Well, we wouldn't multiply it by 10 because that would be distributing it in the wrong direction. It's 200 pounds per square foot applied over the beam width. How wide is the beam? What's that? It's 12 inches wide. So, so I'm saying we're going to take that 200 pounds per square foot and apply it over the beam width to get a distributed load acting along the span. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. So I propose that we take, what's that? Tends the length of the beam, yes. But the width of the beam is the 12 inches. Does that make sense? Well, that, that's, that's true, but what we're, we're not looking at the beams, though. We're looking at the slab. You see what I mean? If we were looking, that, that's a good point. If we were looking at the beams, we would multiply that by 10 feet to collect that load onto the, slab, onto the beam. But we're looking about just the slab. So we just take that and over that 12 inches. That's a good question. That's a good point. All right. Everybody good? So. So I say that WL is the pressure load just times B, which is, uh, now it's 200 pounds per square foot. Could I say 0 0.2 kips per square foot? Would that be a fair point? Excuse me. And I multiply that times what? It's going to be kind of funny. 12 inches and then 1 foot is 12 inches. So I think I'm going to really struggle with this math here, but I think it's 0 0.2 kips per foot. Did I do that right? <laughs> that was a good one, actually. That was pretty good. Does that make sense? What's well, one kind of nice thing about slab design is that part right there, whatever your pressure load is, just it's the same load in kips per foot. Because you're essentially assuming a unit width, a unit width in feet. All right. Everybody good so far? Okay. So we've got a W naught of 0 0.075 kip per foot and a W sub L of 0 0.2 kip per foot, W sub U is what? Got to do the load factoring. We're dealing with LRFD, ultimate strength design here. So 1.2 times 0. 0 0.075 kip per foot plus 1.6 kip per foot about 0 0.41 kip per foot. Now what do I do? It's a beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load, so. And how do we calculate the moment, the maximum moment, for a beam subjected to a uniformly distributed load? Exactly. How long is the beam? We're talking about that slab width, that strip width of the slab. Square that, take the whole thing, divided by 8. 
5.125 foot kips. Now, that might seem like a really small number. It is, okay? Because we're talking about slabs that are relatively thin, they're not, they're not as heavy as something like a beam, and plus, we're only talking about the moment on a slab of strip width that's about yay wide. It shouldn't be that big. So this is the moment per foot of slab. Make sense? So that number should be pretty small. All right, that's step one. And we'll, what's that? Mm -hmm. Just add the loads up, come on. Okay. Right. Step two, what do we do? Required nominal moment. And to do that, what do we need to assume? All right, so we say MN required. which uh, MU over phi, which is 5.125 foot kips divided by, ooh, and then just so I'm being consistent with what comes next, and that gives us 68 68.33 inch kips. How are we feeling? So far so good? Okay. So step three, we need to get our required what? Row. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And Again, because um, we know what the beam looks like, we don't need to assume a row. We can actually derive it and solve for it directly. So row required is, what do I have, 0.85, FC prime over FY, and then 1 minus, 1 minus, And as follows. So again, that's not a typo. One minus shows up twice. All right. 0 0.85 times 4 over 60 for KSI. 60 KSI. Where did I get the 4 and the 60? The 4 was given and grade 60 seal. B is 12 inches, we're dealing with the slab, 5 inches squared. All right, oh, we got a parenthesis. You all have calculators. I'm going to make you all do this. 
I just want you to be familiar with this type of calculation because it is long and I want to make sure you're fine with it. All right, anybody got an answer? 9.8 times 10 to the negative 4. Yeah, that, I've got 0 0.00393. That's what I have. <laughs> Radians. <laughs> Is everybody all right with this? I know it's a long calc. See, the book has like all sorts of tables where they just compute this stuff up. I, I actually think it's a little bit more cumbersome because you have to have a whole bunch more crap to do beam designs. If all you can do is just plug and chug this formula, then it's a whole lot easier. So you need less stuff to do beam design. Okay. All right. Is everybody good? Okay. Okay, so step four is to get our required steel patterns, right? Or required area of steel. Now here's the thing. We're dealing with a slab, so we're going to have to pick two layers of steel. A main steel and a temperature steel, all right? So what do we have? We've got main, we say AS required is just row BD, right? So you tell me what to write. Uh, well, we, I'll, I'll start us off. Tell me what to write. Well, 00393 times what? B is? And what's D? Okay. Plug and chug and you should get 0 0.236 inches squared. Okay. Now what about temperature steel? How do we do that? Well, no, there, there's actually, there's a, there's a plug and chug formula in the handout. I want to see if y'all can find it. There we go. 0.0018BH. It's not D, okay? So it's 0.0018 times 12 inches times 6, okay? So don't get that confused. Don't put five and five. Okay, I've seen students do that. Okay, they're different values. Okay, this one comes out to be about 0 0.13. Now, one thing I'll do is I'll say for both of these, this is per foot of slab. Is everybody all right with that?
All right. Does anybody have any questions before we go on? Now, before we, we start selecting reinforcement patterns, I want to do one thing. For main steel and for temperature steel, we have different spacing requirements. Okay? We can only space those B, our bars out so far. For main steel, our S max is the minimum of 3H and 18 inches, which is the minimum of 3 times 6 inches or 18 inches. Man, that is a tough count. I really got to make sure I've got the radians right on that one. I, I got jokes too, man. And then for temperature steel, S max is the minimum of 5H and 18 inches. That's not, keep in mind, temperature steel is not as big deal in terms of safety. I mean, we can space that steel out a little bit further. But I think you should be able to look at that and just see it's going to be 18 inches. Now, that actually really isn't going to affect our beam design for, or our slab design for this problem. The chart I gave you only gives you slab spacings up to, what, like 12 inches? Now, that's for this chart. Um, I think the one in your book actually goes to like 24, I, th I think. No, it, go, it goes to 18 inches. It goes to 18, sorry. I only gave you the one to 12 because I think that's close enough for government work. Okay. So I'm going to show you how this table works. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at this. All right. So I'm going to write options down. We're going to start off with our first one. Okay. So what I... What I want you to do is look at this table and look at each column one at a time. Now, each column corresponds to the bar size, okay? So, maybe I'll pull this up on the screen just to be consistent. Okay, so each column refers to the bar size. So, this first one is for number three bars, okay? So, what's the first, if we're looking at our main steel, let's just do our main steel first, okay? Main steel, what's our first bar size option that would work for number threes? If we took number threes and spaced them how far apart? Five and a half inches, because if I go up, right there. Does everybody see that? That's for main steel, okay? What's another option for main steel? What about number fours? Could I take number fours and space them at a certain distance? Ten inches. And it's actually the same area of steel, right? So, Mr. Yukonek, if I got the same area of steel with this and this, which one do you think you would go with? The number threes or the number fours? Yeah, I'd go with the number fours because it's less bars to deal with because they're spaced farther apart and we still meet requirements. Does that make sense? Okay, so if I go back to, let me erase this because it's going to show up. So I'll say, let me, let me redo this a little bit. So I'll say for main steel, we had two options. We had um, number threes at 5.5 inches, and we had number fours at 10 inches. And I say choose this one. It's less bars to deal with, okay? Now for temperature steel, what do we have? We have to pick 0 .013 square inches, or 0 .13, not 0 .13, 0 .13. What do you think you'd go with? Number three is at 10 inches. Are there any other options? No.
All right. So therefore, I propose that here's the slab design. And I'm drawing the slab way thicker than it probably is because I want to be very clear what I'm designing. Okay? So I propose that we use a slab that is six inches thick. I propose that we have our main steel, which is uh, number four, ten inches. Let me ask you a question. That main steel, should it be running left to right or in and out of the screen? The main steel. Left to right, because I want it to span the slab. So I'll say my main steel will go like this. Okay? And we'll say that that main steel is number four is at 10 inches. My temperature steel will run in and out of the page or in and out of the screen. And it's going to look something about like this. You know, whatever. And it's number threes at 10 inches. This is what we got. Now, is that our final answer? This is a a trial design. What do we got to verify? That phi equals 0.9. Okay? Now, when we calculate our area of steel for when we calculate our capacity, do we use the main steel or the temperature steel? Main steel. We're calculating capacity. That's what we care about. Okay? So, I'm going to leave you all to do that on your own. Sound good? Does anybody have any questions? Perf well, number four is spaced at 10 inches across however long or your beams are. You see what I mean? No, it, I mean, or, or, I mean, are you good or? Okay, all right, all right. Keep in mind, okay, this slab may go on forever, okay? Assume that it goes on forever. I'm saying for the entire, you know, I mean, it might go like, you know, from here to across 3rd Avenue. I'm just saying take number four bars and space them every 10 inches as far as you need to go. That make sense? Yes? That's a different. Well, that's a different scenario. Um, I'll say one of two things. If it's just like a like a slab on grade, like a patio or something, then it's or, or even like a floor system in a building, it's not. There's not really much structural design that goes into that. I mean, there are some things you need to check, and you need to throw a little bit of steel in there to assume it doesn't crack. But it's not the same story as like an interior floor slab in a building. Now there are slabs on grade that are bearing uh, and what have you. Um, and, and there are also foundations that we need to design. I mean, when you take foundation engineering, all you learn in that class is your footing needs to be four feet wide or three feet wide or whatever. You don't talk at all about how much rebar needs to go in that footing or, or what have you. So that's a whole other you know, can of worms in and of itself. Um, we may cover that. I, sometimes I like covering that, sometimes I don't. Because in order to cover that stuff, it's almost like I need to go back and talk about the Tertzaghi bearing capacity equation and all that stuff that you're going to learn in foundations anyways. So I, I'm really not a fan of covering the same thing twice. I'm a little torn with whether or not I cover that stuff in here because there's foundations like footings and then there's retaining walls, you know, and then you got to talk about active and passive pressures and all that stuff and Huffman goes over it in very substantive detail. I don't need to do it again. So, so yeah. Is everybody good? Now we got a few minutes, so I at least want to talk about what comes next, but I do want to say something very definitive and, and, and substantive. 
from this moment on, we are in exam two territory, okay? From here on out. And from here on out, this is everything that's on your homework that you've got to do, not Monday, but the Monday after, right? Isn't that what we did? You've got the schedule. Whatever's on that schedule is what we're going off of. Everybody good? Okay. I want to talk a little bit about what comes next, which is the discussion of flanged sections, which, let me say this. I really think this is where uh, concrete design gets really interesting. This is where this stuff gets really important. It starts to get really applicable. And there are some serious um, issues that we need to assess with flanged uh, sections, specifically T-beams and L-beams. Now, what do I mean about T-beams and L-beams? You already got one? Okay, what I mean is this, okay? Um, very common in the construction or design of a floor system, we're not worried so much with an individual beam or an individual slab. We can do preliminary sizing to, uh, you know, like if we got a floor system, we can do a beam design to get a rough beam size and a slab design to get a rough slab size. But really, a lot of times we're not dealing with either one of those. What we're dealing with is this, okay? We cast the beams and the floor uh, and the slabs monolithically so that they're kind of the, the, a one unique system, okay? Did everybody get one? Okay. So because of that, what we have to do is treat, like if we're doing a beam analysis, we're not looking at a rectangular beam. We're looking at a rectangular beam with a little bit of that slab acting together. So we engineers are really clever, so we call those T-beams because they look like T's, okay? So what's the difference between a T-beam and an L-beam? An L-beam might be the ones on the very end where all you have is just, you know, the beam and then the, where, where the, uh, the slab starts, okay? So T-beams and L-beams, in the end, the analysis and, and the issues associated with the analysis are the same. And Mr. Eukonek brought up an issue a little bit earlier about what about box beams? Well, a box beam is no different than a T-beam, but instead of having the web in the center, you got half the web over here and half the web over there. But in the end, it's the same, same issues, okay? Is everybody all right with that, that concept? That, that might, uh, you know, Mr. Eukonek, that issue might make a little more sense when we start getting into the math. And you'll see, oh, okay, I get where we're talking about, what we're talking about. All right. Is everybody good? Now, for those of you in steel design, you all already know this terminology. For those of you in concrete design, you might not have heard this yet. So if we're talking about uh, beam anatomy, the center portion of the beam, the, beam, the portion that, is, that primarily resists the shear, we'll talk about that later, is called the web. Any time that you have a very thick portion on the top or the bottom, we call that a flange. You steel design folks know what I'm talking about. Everybody all right with that terminology? Now, one of the things we have to ask ourselves, and let me go back to this image to kind of explain, is when you have a beam, you have to ask yourself how much of that beam, or how much of that flange, if you will, is effective for a given beam. It, it, it would seem to make sense that Okay, if I've got a beam and I'm looking at this T-beam, I might say, you know, how much of that slab is effective? Well, it's halfway over to the next slab, halfway over to the next slab. One point I'll mention is, is that's a little different uh, for, for concrete, especially when I'm talking about resistance. Just because from a load standpoint, I might assume that half that load goes from here, half that load comes from here, that doesn't mean that from a resistance standpoint I can count all of that slab. Now, in my opinion, you should. And, and actually, in bridge engineering, when we calculate effective flange widths for, for bridges, we actually do that very concept. We just say halfway over and halfway over. It's a little bit funkier with, with uh, ACI building design because what we're trying to do is figure out how much of that slab is effective for a given T-beam. Because if you do look at bending stresses, you know, in the entire floor system, you'll find that they kind of dip out when you start getting far away from the beams. So you have to sort of cut out a given portion of that slab and say, okay, that's the portion that we're going to consider effective for that beam. And, and the, the spec uses a somewhat complicated 
uh, uh, model to compute the effective flange width. I think it's a little more complicated than necessary, but you know that's that's debatable. Um, the only other issue I'll mention before the end of uh, of lecture is this. This is where T beams really get complicated, and, and that's uh, um, and, and, I, and they're not really complicated. It's just something you have to take into account. Remember when you do a beam analysis and you're computing MN, what you're trying to do is find the depth of that stress block such that C equals T, right? Well, there's two potential options. One where the depth of the stress block is in the flange and one where it's in the web. If it's in the flange, then this beam is really no different than a rectangular beam, okay? Because I have a rectangular stress block, the depth is A, and the capacity is just ASFYD minus A over 2. It's simple. In this case, however, it's not a rectangular stress block. It's a T-shaped stress block. So we use what's, so there's a difference between a rectangular T-beam and a true T-beam. A rectangular T-beam is one that, yeah, it may look like a T-beam, but when you actually start calculating MN, it's no different than a beam that's just rectangular. This is one that's actually a true T-beam, but we have to be able to assess it a little differently. All right. Is everybody good? That's just a taste of things to come. We'll talk about that Monday. Again, remember, next Wednesday, we're not going to have class. Um, so with that, you all have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.